So how does all of this connect into modern genetics? I keep mentioning to you that today we do things a little different than what Mendel did, but it certainly doesn't mean that what he did was any less important. We just have to understand where we're going to connect this in now. So when we talk dominant and recessive inheritance, what we're really looking at is the inheritance of a genotype, right? Yes, you have particular characteristics that we talk about as a trait or a phenotype, but that really all links back to the genotype that's in your DNA. So what we need to think about as we talk about different traits across organisms and so on is how this genotype can be what we call selected for. Do you have a particular trait that makes you better at something than another organism? Well, in many cases, traits that we talk about in humans aren't necessarily going to save the world, right? Let's take these for example. A couple of different traits that we can see, certainly with genetic links. All of your traits have genetic links. We know what chromosomes are involved in the production of freckles or no freckles, widow's peak or no widow's peak, whether or not your ear lobes are attached. But let's think for a minute. Think about people you know. Okay. Of those people you know, are freckles, do you think, dominant or recessive? What about hairline? Dominant, recessive. Earlobes, dominant, recessive. Which one is which? For most of you, you've probably said that freckles are recessive. Having freckles is rare. So the freckle gene must be recessive if we don't see it very often. What about hairline? Well, this may be harder for you to think about. We don't see everyone's hairline all the time. What about earlobes? The attached earlobe you might think of is actually being recessive. Most of the earlobes that we see are dominant. Well, how does this actually work out? Freckles, widow's peak, and unattached earlobes, or free earlobes, are all dominant. If freckles are dominant, why don't we see them more often? This is our first indication, and we'll talk about it a lot. Dominant does not equal common. Just because a trait is dominant genetically does not mean it is common in a population. We can set up these things known as pedigrees. You may have heard of pedigrees associated with dogs. We can certainly look at other pedigrees. When we set up any family tree like this to consider genetics, it's considered a pedigree. So females are always circles, as I've indicated down here. Males are always squares. I don't make the rules, that's just the way they're set up, okay? So in this case, looking at earlobes, in a first generation, so this is our P generation, we have grandparents, okay? And considering maternal grandparents, say, and paternal grandparents, so your mom's mom and dad and your dad's mom and dad. In this case, with our maternal grandparents, they both have unattached earlobes. These open spaces are white colored spaces. For our paternal side though, grandpa on our paternal side has attached earlobes. That's a recessive trait, remember we said. So if that's recessive, that means that it has to join with a heterozygote to give offspring with, a, with free earlobes. Has that happened? Sure, you can see that here. 
grandma here is a heterozygote. That means that the possibility exists if you set up your cross. Remember, you can always set up a cross to think about this if you want. Big F, little f. And they're actually getting a 1 to 3 ratio of attached versus unattached earlobes, right? Okay. So when we look at this ratio carrying forward, we could follow down the maternal side if you want. The same thing still applies. Here you're crossing two heterozygotes. You should know for what that is, crossing two heterozygotes in a monohybrid cross always gives you a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. Okay. Now, do the stats always match exactly? No. They had four children, and they don't have the exact four ratio that we predicted. But this goes back to independent assortment in gametes. It's random which allele enters which gamete. So by that means, you're not going to get a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio in a small population. If we looked at this across the entire human population, you just might. So then when we finally get down to our sisters here at the bottom, one has, has um, attached earlobes. One has unattached earlobes, right? So what do you think? Do you think this sister is big F, big F, or big F, little f? Why would you think that? Now, earlobes aren't necessarily all that critical for us to consider, neither is hairline or freckles, but when we start to think about inherited disorders in humans, recessive and dominance becomes very important. So when we look at recessive inheritance of disorders in humans, you have to inherit two recessive genes, right? If you're going to show the recessive, you have to be homozygous recessive. You must, OK? Dominant inheritance, this is a more rare condition. We'll look at how recessive alleles carry in the population. Dominant alleles that cause disease, particularly ones that are lethal, are eliminated from the population very quickly. Why? Because remember, to show a dominant trait, You only need one copy of the dominant allele. So you can be big B, big B, or big B, little b. If big B is lethal, either one of these would end in death. There are a couple of disorders here for you to think about if you're interested. Um, recessive disorders at the top, a number of them. We'll talk about some of these later on. Dominant disorders at the bottom, these can be very, very deadly. Um, when we look at Alzheimer's and so on, you may not associate it with being lethal, um, but it certainly, when it shows, has all kinds of, of considerations for what is going on as far as quality of life and, and neurological disorders in these individuals. So we'll talk about more of these disorders as we go through evolution.